All right, so let's get started. So hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Patrick Chanezon. I work at Docker. Uh, and today, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, all the news that happened in the Docker ecosystem. Uh, this talk is focused on orchestration. Uh, and um, I call it Welcome to the Jungle, because it's a real jungle out there. And uh, the goal of the talk is to give you some ideas about the various systems and the trade-offs you have to make uh, when you're choosing one or the other, uh, and to give you a state of the art of uh, what's happening right now in, uh, in orchestration for Docker. And uh, I understand that I'm between you and your lunch, so I'll try to make it entertaining with uh, a lot of demos. All right, so I, I just keep what, what I've been doing. I, I just spent 10 years building software at various companies and then 10 years doing evangelism. And I joined Docker six months ago to help uh, Solomon build the platform there. Um, so orchestration is really a, a jungle. There are lots of different players in there. And, uh, and I'm, I'm going to go through the various types uh, of players there are. Uh, but basically, if you're, lots of developers started using Docker in the past two years, uh, and the next step after they start having an app and they want to put it in production is they talk to their apps, and they need to start orchestrating all these containers at scale in production, and that's where the fun begins. Hopefully, there are lots of people who are going to sell you orchestration solutions. Uh, this is one of the gallery of the people involved. Um, well, one of the things I wanted to, to say is uh, my, my reason for joining Docker is um, uh, many years ago, uh, when I was building client-server applications in, uh, in the early 90s, uh, the, the browser came out. And I remember in 95, when I used Netscape for the first time, I realized, hey, there's a new way of building apps. Uh, with HTML, and uh, we're just going to put all the code on the server side, and, and the new client will be the browser. And then I spent the next 20 years building that kind of apps. Uh, when I started playing with Docker while I was at Microsoft, uh, which is like two years ago, uh, I, I had the same kind of epiphany. This is something, uh, this is a tool that when you start using it every day, uh, you just realize you're going to build your apps in a different way. Uh, so I'll skip this one. Okay. Yeah. I like that quote very much. The future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Uh, so Docker has been used, uh, or Docker containers have been used at, at Google for many years. Uh, and lots of the large uh, consumer companies are using it uh, to manage their workloads at scale. Uh, what's happening right now is Docker made it super easy to create containers, uh, and, and now everybody starts to, uh, to use them, and now the problem is the tools for orchestrating them as not, are, are not as mature uh, as you would wish. So our mission at Docker is to build tools of mass innovation. I really like the, the, uh, the statement there. And what we mean by that is that these days, uh, What's the most interesting thing to, uh, to program these days is the internet. There are lots of different devices, uh, but there are silos for developers. So if you're building for Android or for iPhone, uh, if you're building for cars, you have different specialized operating systems. Uh, and what we're trying to do is to do a unified layer uh, that people can use to program uh, the internet. Uh, the, the place of Docker in the cloud market, uh, so that, that's a slide I, I used when I was at Microsoft, uh, and I was, I was explaining to my team why I thought Docker was important. Uh, in the, I'd say in the past five years, uh, there's this big fight that happened between uh, the three giants of cloud, uh, Amazon, who started the market, uh, Microsoft, who followed suit, suit and then uh, uh, Google, uh, uh, who followed as well. So you have these three large players, uh, and then so they're, they're mostly public cloud. And then you have VMware, who owns all the workloads uh, in the data center uh, for private cloud. 
And when I remember when I was at Google and I tried to sell Google App Engine for business and I talked to customers, uh, the, main, um, uh, the main answer they, told, they, they gave me was, we're not interested in something purely public cloud, we want something hybrid. So Microsoft understood that and they have a pretty good hybrid strategy. VMware is trying to get a hybrid strategy as well uh, with uh, vCloud Air. Uh, Google with Kubernetes, uh, I think, starts to have finally a, a, a hybrid strategy. They did this partnership with CoreOS where you can buy CoreOS plus Kubernetes to set up behind the firewall and then you use a Google um, a container service uh, on, on the public cloud. So, so finally they have, they have something where you can use the same APIs to deploy your app internally or externally. Amazon, they don't have a, a real story for that yet. And to me, what happened is that when Docker arrived two years ago, it kind of re reorganized the whole industry around it. Uh, and what I mean by that is that the new, uh, the new system right now looks like this. The new platform, it's uh, at the bottom, you have the hardware. So instead of hardware now, uh, it's cloud services and virtualization. So that's uh, the system that provide your application all the resources, uh, storage, compute, and networking. On top of that, you have the operating system, and the operating systems um, um, shrunk in the, really in the past yeah, two years, I would say. They all shrunk. It started with CoreOS, who started this distribution that's really designed for the data center, that's very small, uh, with just a few utilities and uh, Docker to run workloads. Uh, then very quickly, uh, Red Hat and CoreOS, uh, Red Hat and Ubuntu followed with Project Atomic and Ubuntu Core. Uh, VMware a few months ago launched uh, Photon, which is their own uh, small Linux distro. My favorite in there is Rancher OS. Uh, they went all the way where in Rancher you just have the Linux kernel and you have two Docker engines. Uh, you have a, a Docker daemon for system, a system daemon where you run uh, your system utilities in privileged mode, and then your user and Docker where you run your regular workloads. Uh, and even Microsoft followed suit with that uh, where they started implementing Docker for Windows. So they re-implemented the backend of Docker in terms of uh, Windows isolation primitives as opposed to Linux isolation primitives. So you're using the same API, but you can deploy uh, a .NET application that run on Windows. And when they did that, they also created a new version of uh, Windows Server that's called Nano Server. That's much smaller. They removed all the UI and all the stuff that you don't need when you just want to run containers. At the center of the ecosystem, you have Docker. On the left here, what you can see is uh, add-on to Docker, and I'll talk about them today. Uh, Weave uh, for networking, uh, uh, Flocker for, um, uh, for volume management. And then on the right, you have orchestration, and this is really where the jungle is. There's lots of competition in there. I'd say the three leads in there are Docker Swarm, Mesos, and Kubernetes. But there are lots of other options. Uh, Cloud Foundry is reinventing itself as, an uh, as a container orchestration solution. Uh, IBM with Bluemix, which is based on Cloud Foundry, added Docker support to it. And then there's DES, which is a Heroku-like orchestration solution that you can, that's open source and that you can, you can install behind the firewall. Uh, initially, they were based on Fleet, and now they're based on Kubernetes. So there's lots of movement and action in there. So the business opportunity, why, uh, why, why is it interesting to get interested in that? Uh, one of the reasons is that as developers, we love complexity. Uh, and so a lot of people uh, have started building their own paths internally. Uh, and, uh, and instead of that, we, with Docker, it kind of gives you the right level of abstraction for building a system uh, that would have the same characteristics as a path, but would give you all the flexibility to run the kind of workloads you, you want, as opposed to being uh, stuck into the opinionated choices of a path. Uh, another aspect is uh, uh, Agile really gets mainstream, uh, like it started around like 2000, and now everybody's doing it. Uh, and one of the aspects uh, that goes with microservices that I like a lot from, uh, it's a quote from uh, uh, Adrian Cockcroft at Netflix, uh, they use this metric called the uh, uh, the mean time between ID and making stuff happen. I like that very much. Uh, I think most of the tools that we're building uh, are really about that, like lowering that time. 
Uh, and then agility means that uh, agility and using powerful tools uh, that uh, at the right level of abstraction, it also means uh, dollars. And what I mean by that is that it means your developers are not spending time building infrastructure, they're spending time creating business value. Another trend that happened in the past five years, this one, uh, to me that's a continuation of Agile, is DevOps. So from the mainframe era, uh, devs and ops uh, weren't really uh, seeing eye to eye together. They weren't programming in the same languages. And, uh, and, and sometimes I, I remember writing COBOL applications. Some of the ops guys were running workloads. They didn't have the source code for it anymore. Uh, client server, it wasn't much better. Uh, the classic tale of the client server or the client side developer who has to argue with the Oracle database admin. Uh, during the web, it was horrendous. Uh, we weren't using the same languages. All the sysadmins were using Perl. On the, on the other side, we were using C or Java. Uh, what happened with, uh, in the past five years with DevOps is that devs and ops are working hand in hand. And DevOps is more a culture, cultural movement than anything else. So it's about people and processes as well as tools a little bit, and I think Docker plays an important role there as a tool for enabling that. Because the container, as a developer, you're building a container, and that's the same artifact that's going to be run in production by your, uh, by your apps. So Docker itself, uh, it's based on, uh, uh, basically it's a packaging of uh, uh, Linux kernel features for isolation and control. So namespaces give you uh, isolation for your process, your network, uh, the mounts that you're making. And then C groups give you control over how much memory you want the process to have access to, how many CPUs and stuff like that. So basically Docker packages all that in a simple to use user interface. Another aspect that's super important in Docker, and that I think was a big reason for its success, is the, the image layers. So when you're running a Docker image, it's actually composed of several layers, and you can do inheritance there. And what that means is that uh, if you're running um, like 15 containers who all are based on Ubuntu with small changes, uh, for the first time you download the Ubuntu image, the second time you download only the changes. And so that, that's... I think that's very powerful compared to VMs where you have to download four gigs uh, with everything on it uh, every time. So Docker's mission is, built, is to build tools to build, shape, and run applications. So let's take a look at uh, each of the tools uh, in these various areas. So, so for building, you have uh, Docker itself. As a developer, the way you use it is that you, you use a declarative format that's called a Docker file, where you specify the stuff you want in your image. Uh, Typically, you would inherit from one of the official images. So here, if I'm a Java developer, I'm going to inherit from Java, and I can specify a version in there. Uh, then I copy the source of my, uh, uh, the source of my app in there. Uh, I specify a working directory. And then here, I'm running a compilation of my code. Um, and then once you've done that, you can build the image with a Docker build uh, you, minus T. You can specify your name. Uh, and then you can run your container, and when you're done with it, you can push it to, the, uh, to Docker Hub or a private registry. So on top of that, typically when you're building microservice applications, very quickly you have five, six services, like a front-end, a back-end, a database, uh, maybe some workers running in there, some caching layer with Redis. Uh, so typically you don't want to have to write a shell script to launch all these containers and link them together. In order to make that simpler, we have a tool that's called Docker Compose. So that's another declarative format that's in YAML this time, where you specify uh, all the containers that you want to run. You assign them some name. You can scale them independently. Uh, so you can specify some build instructions, the command to run, uh, the ports, many of the options that are on the Docker command line, you specify them in there. You can specify your volumes. Uh, and in the past, which means uh, since uh, until last month, uh, you could specify links. So you could link container together uh, the networking layer, uh, and they, they could talk together with the names that you gave in the link. The way that was implemented was not scalable. It, it applied only on the same host. So you couldn't link containers who were on different hosts, which was a big problem for orchestration. So people had a bunch of systems uh, like ambassador patterns, uh, 
uh, or, or different hacks for connecting containers across uh, different hosts. Uh, instead of that, now uh, I'll show you in 1.9, one of the big news is the new networking features that render links uh, obsolete. Okay, then you have Docker machine. Uh, one of the, um, the things that happens when you start working with Docker is that very quickly you're, initially you're running on your laptop, but very quickly you want to have some servers for testing in one of the cloud providers or in VMware or in different virtualization layers. Uh, di di virtualization solutions. Docker Machine is a very simple tool that has a bunch of drivers that lets you provision a machine in any cloud uh, with a Docker daemon installed on it and configured with certificates and all that stuff. Uh, so it makes it super easy to uh, switch machines and uh, provision machines on the fly and, and destroy them when you don't need them. Uh, so that's an example of creating one on Azure. So I use the Azure driver. There are some Azure specific data in there where I specify which region, which uh, my certificate and subscription ID, the user I want, and then a name. So Docker Machine has lots of drivers. The last release of Docker Machine that was released uh, two weeks ago, uh, I think it's 0 0.5. Uh, uh, in there, Nathan uh, refactored machine pretty profoundly where before all the drivers were in a single code base, now he, uh, he created a plugin architecture. So, pl so now plugins for each provider can live in their own code base uh, and then they will be assembled by machine when you're running it. So it makes it easier for maintenance. Uh, then there's Kitematic. So Kitematic is a, uh, it's a UI for Docker. Uh, I remember when I was at Microsoft, when I started training people, uh, my colleagues uh, uh, in, in Docker, after half an hour on the command line, one, one of the guys told me, hey, there's no UI for this. So I said, no, at that time there was not. So now there's one that works both on Mac and Windows. I think they're working on Linux right now. So that's the build part. These are the tools that, as a developer, you're using to build your applications. Then there's the shipping part. How do you ship your application? So for that, there's Docker Hub. So Docker Hub has, a, I don't remember, like a gazillion of images. Uh, some of them are official, so they're maintained. Uh, ups, uh, and all the security patches upstream are, are, are up to date on them. Uh, but then there are also a lot of community images. Uh, so when you're really interested in some obscure programming languages, maybe some old versions, there's a high chance that someone has built a Docker file and created an image for that. Uh, I find that super convenient. Docker Hub, uh, when we're talking about DevOps, this is really where Dev and Ops uh, uh, meet together. Uh, devs are building their images and they're pushing them to the Hub, and then Ops are pulling them from the Hub and running them in production. So Docker is a company, it's a private company, so we need to make money. Uh, our business model is to build uh, commercial solutions based on our open source solutions. So Hub has, uh, uh, I think in Hub you can have one private repo and you can pay for more. Uh, but we also have something called Docker Trusted Registry that you can buy to install behind the firewall. And it has enterprise features like LDAP integration, Active Directory, and all that stuff. Um, so that's for shipping and then for running. Um, yeah, so for running, uh, one, one of the things I wanted to touch upon is uh, plugins. Uh, one of the philosophy behind Docker is uh, batteries included but replaceable. And so what that means is that uh, we try to build plugins for many of the aspects of the tools that we're building. So for example, for Swarm, uh, we can plug a different scheduler. Uh, there's an integration between Swarm and Mesos. Uh, for Engine, there's the volume plugins. I think there are like four of them, uh, or maybe more now. Uh, I discovered one like only last week. Uh, network plugins, there are six of them. So we have batteries included with the new networking feature in 1.9. But uh, if you don't like the way it's done, you can just switch to one of the plugins in there. And some of them have really interesting characteristics. Like for example, Weave gives you a very nice visualization of uh, your network traffic between your containers uh, when you're developing. And then uh, for service discovery, uh, it's pluggable with a console, etcd, and Zookeeper as well. So then for running your application, there's Docker Engine. Uh, and with Docker Engine, uh, you configure your client to talk to one engine. Uh, that's not very convenient when you want to 
like launch 100,000 containers on maybe 10,000 machines. So for that, we have Docker Swarm. Uh, Swarm is a daemon that sits be, uh, in front of uh, your, uh, your set of Docker engines, and it talks to them, and you as a client, you use the same Docker client, it talks the same API as Docker, uh, and you use your Docker client to talk to Swarm, you ask it to schedule your workloads on one or, or the other, uh, your workloads with some constraints. Uh, so you can specify constraints on CPU, affinities, and anti-affinities, uh, and then Swarm will just schedule it uh, based on strategies that are pluggable as well. You can choose which strategy you want, whether you want bin pack, uh, where you want everything on the same, uh, on as little machine as possible, or random, uh, or evenly spread among the, uh, across the cluster. One of the things that is really missing in Swarm, uh, and we got lots of comments about that, uh, and that's part of Kubernetes. Uh, so Kubernetes has a really nice uh, load balancing. It's, it's part of the platform. Uh, at Docker, we have something called Interlock. So that's a project by Evan Hazlett. It's an open source project. And the way it works is that uh, it listens to swarm events. So every time there's a container that's scheduled, Swarm generates an event, and you can listen to these events. So Interlock is a simple Go program that connects to the socket for, um, uh, for Swarm, listen to the events, and every time there are some events, he ch it changes, it, it, it uh, regenerates a configuration for either HAProxy or Nginx, and there's a plugin architecture, so you can create new ones, uh, and then restarts uh, Nginx or HAProxy. The problem with interlock, uh, as I'll tell you a little bit later, is that with the new networking stuff, it doesn't work anymore because um, uh, with networking, the network events are not exposed in, um, uh, in the swarm uh, set of events yet. Uh, Madhu, who's working on networking, is working on that. So that, that will come soon, and then we can have a new version of interlock that uh, supports that. Uh, and then the last aspect is uh, Project Orca. Uh, so that's a commercial offering that we announced at DockerCon uh, last June. Uh, there will probably be more news about it uh, at, uh, at DockerCon EU next week. Uh, and that's a, a platform for, um, for running your containers and monitoring them and all that, that you can buy and install behind the firewall. And then there's Tutum. Uh, so the October 21, 2015, which is the day that uh, Marty from Back to the Future came back uh, today, uh, uh, Docker and Tutum joined forces. So Tutum uh, came to Docker. Uh, and Tutum is an interesting um, orchestration platform as a software as a service. So, so it's on demand. You just create an account over there. But you can bring your own machines in there. So you can give it your Azure credentials, your Amazon credentials, and you can bring your infrastructure in Tutum. Tutum will manage uh, to install a Docker engine on it and will manage your containers on it. Uh, one of the interesting aspects there is that it also lets you bring behind the firewall resources if you set up the right networking with it. Uh, so that means that you, if you don't want to set up your own orchestration uh, uh, behind the firewall, you can still manage workloads with this uh, behind the firewall. So basically, once uh, Tutum and, uh, and Orca are, are, uh, will be out, uh, we'll have a solution for SaaS and for on-premise. So there are lots of enterprises who are using Docker nowadays. And one of the important aspects of, uh, of Docker is open standards. Uh, last year, yeah, I think it was last year, we started getting lots of remarks from uh, lots of companies saying, hey, you, you guys became a de facto standard. Now it's really time, we're all betting on you, on your technology, but now it's really time to create a formal standard. And so last June at DockerCon, we announced uh, the Open Container Initiative. Uh, there's 35 companies in there, uh, pretty much everybody in the, in the field. Uh, and we all agreed to uh, create a standard for container runtime, as well as the uh, image bundle that is run by the container runtime, which means the, the layout on the file system of the image. And so that's a spec. Uh, the OCI charter is soon finalized. We finally agreed on the scope of the, of the spec uh, pretty recently. 
Now there are still some discussion with lawyers that may take a month or two, and uh, so we'll, we'll have the charter soon finished. On the spec side, uh, the working group started working right after DockerCon, and so they have a, a 0 0.01 version of the spec already, and they made lots of advances. One of the important aspects of uh, the spec is that uh, we established it with the goal of having a strong reference implementation, and so Docker gave libcontainer to that project. And there's a project in there that's called RunC, which is the reference implementation of the OCI spec, uh, which is basically a command line on top of libcontainer. And so RunC is... Um, uh, so RunC implements the spec, you can run it today, it's more advanced than Docker in terms of isolation features. Uh, so, for example, you can do uh, user namespaces are part of it already. Uh, it just arrived in Docker, uh, actually, this, uh, this release in 1.9. Uh, but, but it was already in RunC. And there are some stuff like CreU, for example, um, a snapshot and restore of containers. Uh, Arno, um, Arno and Michael, my colleagues, gave a super demo at uh, DockerCon last June of uh, uh, like playing a video game connected to a server in Singapore. They just uh, snapshot, snapshot it, moved it to Amsterdam, and they could continue playing their, their, their game uh, in real time. There's a, there's a video out there on that. So RunC allows you to do that today. Uh, and the goal is for um, the next versions of Docker, probably in 1.10, uh, is going to be, the isolation is going to be implemented in terms of RunC, so Docker will just call RunC behind the scenes. Uh, there's also Cloud Foundry who decided to adopt RunC for the backend for their uh, garden techno isolation technology. So it's a, it's a pretty successful project and it's advancing pretty fast. And the last aspect is plumbing. So Docker is made of a lot of plumbing, uh, but it's all mishmashed in the same code base. Uh, one of the efforts we started last June is to start to extract these pieces of plumbing and make them separate uh, utilities that you can use uh, by themselves without needing to use the whole Docker, uh, which many people find very opinionated. So if you, if you don't like our opinions, just use our plumbing. Uh, so Notary is one of these plumbings. Uh, it allows you to determine whether the images that you want to run are exactly uh, who you think they are. Uh, and then RunC is the first uh, piece of plumbing that we did, but there are others that are going to come out. And that's a t-shirt I built for <laughs> RunC. Uh, so Docker 1.9. One of the main news in 1.9 is uh, Docker networking and volumes, which were present in uh, experimental branch. Uh, now they're part, of, uh, they're part of mainstream. So out of the box, you have support for overlay networking uh, in Docker and also in Swarm. Uh, so that, that's super important for orchestration, and I'll show you an example of that. Uh, uh, node discovery is better now with uh, the cluster store and cluster advertise options for the engine. So now your engines can just say, hey, I, I'm, I'm at this IP address and they tell that to a discovery service that could be console or etcd, and then they all discover each other. Um, and, and Docker volumes, uh, as well as networking, both have a plugin architecture, so you can use uh, plugins uh, instead of the, the Docker built-in stuff. Uh, there's been a few improvements in Builder, uh, a new uh, AWS logger, and one of the big things is uh, the user namespaces. Uh, phase one, which means it's a very simple version of that, uh, where you can map uh, one user uh, in your container. Uh, actually, the fact that you're here means that you're not that interested in uh, user namespaces because uh, Phil Estes, who coded that, uh, he's giving a talk right now uh, in another room about this. So, tough choices. <laughs> Uh, super interesting stuff. Uh, 1.10, we're planning to uh, integrate RunC into Docker directly. Uh, uh, some, some improvements in distribution, uh, networking, there will be a lot of bugs to fix, I'm sure, uh, when, when we find them, when we, people start using them. And user namespaces, uh, the, 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 the way it was implemented is only a first step. There are lots of, new, uh, lots of other, other things to do in that area. So let's talk briefly about orchestration. Uh, okay, so Docker Swarm, I talked about it. It's uh, 
So you put it in front. Uh, it exposes a, a set of Docker engines as a single engine. Uh, it's very easy to get started. So you can provision. Uh, one of the things that we improved in the past six months is the integration between the different tools. So now you can provision Swarm with Docker machine. You can provision it in a way where you can pass all the information to your, uh, to your Docker engines about the networking discovery and all that. Uh, I'll show you that. So, so it's very, very easy to set up. And, uh, and actually, one of, the, um, uh, one of the interesting aspect of this is that it's so easy to set up compared to Kubernetes, for example, which is very opinionated in the networking layer it needs. Uh, that at, at KubeCon, I think it was on Monday, uh, my colleagues uh, Sam and Alex uh, from, the, from the Swarm team did a demo of uh, installing Kubernetes on top of Swarm. So Kubernetes is pretty painful to install. Uh, I remember having spent lots of time to try to install it on Azure. You have to use a virtual networking layer, either Weave or Flannel. That, that's what people are using usually. Uh, and with Swarm, now that we have networking built in, uh, basically you install your Swarm cluster and you deploy all the Kubernetes components uh, as, um, as just Docker services on top of that. The only thing is that you have to give the, the kubelet service access to uh, the socket of the underlying uh, Docker engine on that node. That, that's, uh, that, that opens lots of interesting possibilities there. Uh, so the Swarm scheduler is doing resource management with memory, CPU, and network. Uh, and, and then uh, it applies filters to exclude some nodes based on what you're, you're giving it. So you can specify affinities. Uh, and then it uses a strategy to, um, uh, to, to pick the best node. Uh, Swarm is, integration, is integrated with Machine and Compose. I'll show you that. Uh, uh, and then uh, there's a Mesos integration. Uh, the way Mesos works is that uh, the Mesos master, Mesos is a two-level scheduler, so the Mesos master is really managing the resources in the cluster, and then uh, based on these resources, it creates a bunch of offers that it sends to frameworks, and frameworks are a second level of scheduling. And the notion in Mesos is that the application knows best, the application developer knows best how they want to schedule their resources. So you can build your own scheduler uh, in what is called a framework. So there are a bunch of frameworks out there in Mesos, and uh, what we did is that we worked with Mesosphere uh, to create a, a Swarm Mesos framework. So the way it works is that you're talking to the Swarm Mesos framework with a regular Docker API, so you want to schedule a container with some affinities and constraints. And then Mesos Master sends uh, the Swarm Mesos frameworks a bunch of offers. If there are some offers that fit, uh, Swarm is just going to schedule the container on these. Uh, so that allows you to, if you have chosen Mesos for your orchestration platform, you can still use Swarm uh, as a client. So what's new in Swarm? Uh, one of the big news in Swarm is that Swarm is going 1.0. So last week, uh, we released Swarm 1.0. It's stable now. And before, we used to say Swarm is not ready for production, it's not being tested and all that. In the past six months, they, they spent lots of time doing uh, testing and especially uh, scalability testing uh, and stability. And, uh, and now it's, it's, it's ready for production. It, it's also integrated with lib network, so you can do overlay networking over a Swarm cluster. Uh, and it has the support for volume plugins. So that means that you can start working with uh, stateful uh, stateful containers with databases and, and schedule them in a cluster with, with volumes that will follow you if you reschedule somewhere else. So in terms of production readiness, uh, we've made some tests on Amazon on uh, more than a thousand node, uh, and the results were really good, which means uh, even in the 99th percentile, the time to schedule a container is uh, 360 milliseconds. Um, and then the performance is pretty good as well. Um, yeah, so, so Swarm works well uh, at heavy loads, uh, and it's, integrating, it's integrated with uh, networking and volume. And load balancing, I talked about it already. Uh, on the roadmap, one of the interesting aspects that's going to happen in the next few months is that uh, Swarm and Engine are coming closer together. Uh, so I think in the current release, they started um, like using a common API layer at the code level. Uh, uh, but in the future, 
like they're going to merge together and be closer and closer. And at the end of it, if you think about it, um, you could consider Docker Engine as a swarm of one. So that, that's kind of the, the philosophy with which we're going with that. Now let's talk briefly about Mesos. So it's an Apache project. It's very mature. It's used in a lot of companies. I think it started at Twitter, and it's used in, in lots of large consumer companies who have uh, very large clusters. Uh, and now it's getting into the enterprise. They have a whole ecosystem of frameworks. So the Swarm frameworks is only one of them. There's Marathon and Kronos. Uh, yesterday, uh, I think it was yesterday, Yelp released uh, um, a, a, a platform as a service that they built internally, and they released it as open source. Uh, it's called Pasta, and it's based on Mesos plus uh, Marathon and uh, Kronos, I think. Um, yeah, so I talked to you about how Mesos worked already and uh, how the, um, the integration is done. Uh, Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is, uh, I'd say it's more complicated to install, and there are a few more concepts to learn as a developer. So the first concept is the one of pods. Uh, in Dockerland, when you're building your microservice, we encourage you to do one process per container. Uh, at Google, they were used to having like a, a log manager, for example, who I aggregated the logs in the same, in the same uh, isolation space as the, the main workload. And, and, and so they have this notion of pod. What a pod is, is it's a set of containers uh, who share the same PID namespace so they can talk to each other, inter-process communication. They share the same volumes and they have the same IP address and they are scheduled together. So first you're building pods. After that, you schedule your pods with what is called a replication controller. So a replication controller, uh, uh, Kubernetes has a declarative API with a reconciliation loop. Uh, which means that uh, you can say, I want three of these, and there should be always three alive. Uh, and so you create a replication controller with a value of three, and uh, if one of your pods dies, Kubernetes is going to reschedule it somewhere else. And then uh, your pods, when you schedule them, have labels. Uh, so there are labels in Docker as well. And then, based on these labels, uh, you, you can create what is called a service. And a service is essentially a query on a label. So you say, all the pods that are labeled with this, I'm going to load balance them with uh, a service. So they have load, balance, load balancing uh, uh, included in the platform. So that's really convenient for getting started. I think right now in 1.1, they introduced a new uh, pluggable load balancer, so you can bring your own. Uh, because load balancers, when you're using a cloud platform, like Google or Azure, they have their own load balancer and you want to leverage that. Then there's Cloud Foundry and Bluemix. So Cloud Foundry is really a big beast. Uh, it was based on build packs, uh, so that means uh, there are certain frameworks that are understood by Cloud Foundry, and the notion is that as a developer, you focus on your code, push it to the platform, and the platform takes care of scaling it and, and, and checking its health and all that. The problem with it is that uh, developers wanted to bring more, uh, more stuff in their workloads than what was allowed by the past. And so when uh, Cloud Foundry started to mature and see that change in the industry, and they're, they're talking to lots of enterprise, uh, like Fortune 500 customers, I think that's their sweet spot. Uh, what they did is that they created that new project called Diego, which is a container orchestration, orchestration engine. Uh, it is based on uh, Garden, which is an isolation technology, and uh, that's where they are, they are plugging RunC right now. But they, they don't use Docker itself, so they're pulling the layers from the hub themselves, assembling them on disk, and then in the future they're going to run that with RunC. So you have Diego. And they created that sub-project that's smaller than Cloud Foundry, because Cloud Foundry is really a big system to deploy. You, you actually need a distributed system to deploy it. That's called Bosch. Uh, so, it, so it's kind of hard to bootstrap. They created that smaller project that's called Lattice, uh, where you have just uh, the log manager, the router, um, the route emitter, and, and Diego. Uh, and so they're trying to reinvent themselves as a container orchestration in there. <clears throat> Then there's IBM Bluemix. Uh, so Bluemix is a super interesting platform. They made the choice at IBM, so they, they, they go very, uh, they are very fond of uh, um, 
like building real-world solutions on top of open source. So they took OpenStack as a base, they added uh, Cloud Foundry on top of it, and when Docker started to get traction, they added Docker in there. Uh, so, you, so you have the, the three platforms in there. Okay, so that's Bluemix. And then there are, uh, so, so all these solutions that I talked about are things that you can install behind the firewall. Uh, they are also uh, now all the big three today, uh, since uh, last month or two months ago when uh, Microsoft announced their container service. All the big three has a, have a container service. Um, and then there's Tutum, so I talked about that. So Tutum is now part of Docker, and Tutum goes way beyond orchestration. They're doing all the CI, CD as well. Then there's Triton from Joyon, that's an interesting offering. Uh, I'm going to accelerate because I want to have some time for the demo. Uh, so in summary, I'd say it's uh, Swarm, Mesos, Kubernetes. That's kind of the big, uh, the big three there, and different styles. So let's do some demos. So I want to show you uh, Docker networking and how you can use that with Machine and Compose. Uh, so in order to do that, I'm going to show you a Spring Boot application that my friend uh, Josh Long built. Uh, so it's called uh, Spring Doggy, uh, and it's a very simple application that has a, an Angular front-end, uh, a back-end with a Spring API, uh, an API built in Spring, and then the back-end is a MongoDB database, and they're using MongoFS, and so the app lets you like take a picture, drop it in there in your browser, and it will just manipulate it and serve it. And th there's also some WebSocket for showing uh, all the pictures that are coming. So. Uh, I used to, so I, I, I sent Josh a Docker file and then a Compose file, uh, and when 1.9 came out, uh, I started modifying my Compose file to see uh, what it would look like in the new world. Uh, so let me show you that. Uh, okay. Mm hmm. Did it work? No, the web server died. Okay, so let me show you the code first. Uh, okay, so that's the, oh yeah. Uh, so that's the Spring Boot application. You have the Java source code in there, and in there you have a Docker file. So it's a very simple Docker file. Uh, it's a Java 8 application, so I inherit from Java 8. Uh, I expose port 8080, and then uh, I suppose that I have built my, uh, I, I've done a Maven package in my source repository, generated a jar file. I just copy that jar file in that uh, path inside of the image. I set that as the working directory, and then the command is very simple. It's a Java minus jar of a spring doggy jar. And I passed to it the port that I wanted to start on and, um, and also the, the URI for MongoDB. So I need to pass a URI to that container that contains the connection string for connecting to the MongoDB database. So how do I start all that? So I have a compose file. And so that's the uh, old style compose file where I have my web container. My image is the one that I built before. Uh, so I pushed it on the hub. Uh, I expose port 8080, uh, and, and here you can see I use links. So in the old world, you would use links, and you would schedule them on the same, uh, on the same host. And here I link to Mongo, and Mongo is here, and it's just running a Mongo database. Uh, in a production system, you would just map a, a, a drive on the machine uh, for your data slash DB directory. Uh, and so the result of that is that when I'm on, in my web container, the host Mongo is accessible to me uh, for that database, which means that for my MongoDB URI, I can pass it as Mongo there. That's it, so that works. Now with uh, networking, um, let's take a look at what that looks like. Uh, so I killed that guy. Uh, off. Maybe I have it open somewhere already. Uh, with networking, yeah. Yeah, so actually, uh, so let me show you with networking. So with networking is the same thing. I enhance the compose file a little bit because now that we have virtual networking, what, what will happen when I do a compose up? Uh, instead of just doing a compose up, I'm obliged to pass uh, 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 minus minus x uh, dash networking. 
uh, just to activate networking in Compose, uh, and then specify the networking driver, and here I want overlay, which is creating an overlay network of all my machines in the Swarm cluster. Uh, and by default, Compose is going to create a network uh, that's called the name of my application. Uh, then I can specify, because they won't be on the same machines, I can specify some, some constraints for Swarm. So here you see that Compose and Swarm are integrated. So here what I do is that for the, the web server, I just tell, I want an affinity rule where I want the, the Compose service is going to be the name that Compose is going to give to my uh, database there. I want, I, I want the, the web server to be uh, scheduled on a different host than the, where my DB is. And then for Mongo, I have a, a constraint that's labeled. So I pass to it a label, I say, I want to be scheduled on a host that is labeled with SSD. Uh, and then the last thing, uh, the big difference in networking here is that container name. So here I can specify a container name, I say it's, it's going to be called DB. And the result of it is that uh, the host name for that machine on the, on the private network just for this application is going to be DB. Now, there are some limitations here. So the, the integration is not completely finalized uh, because that doesn't work if I want to scale, uh, to scale that, that container. So if I do a Docker Compose scale web equals two, it's going to generate two containers for the web uh, tier. Uh, one that's called application name uh, dash spring doggy uh, uh, underscore spring doggy underscore one, and then underscore spring doggy under, uh, underscore two. And there, I cannot use that for service discovery, and I cannot specify a container name in that case. So you can use container name only for services where you have only one host. So it's okay for development, not, not really great for production yet. Uh, and now I wanted to show you another example that I, uh, that I failed to make work. Or I, I made it work once and then I couldn't kill the container. So there, there are still some bugs in there. Uh, but I made it work once. Uh, so that one is using, it's using the same stuff that I showed you. Uh, but in addition to that, it's using, um, uh, it's using the Rexray uh, volume plugin that is, has been built by EMC. And so what Rexray is doing is that it's, uh, it has some drivers, and uh, notably they have an um, uh, EC2 driver. So you give Rexray your EC2 credentials, and every time you do a Docker volume create, which is what Compose is doing behind the scenes, uh, Rexray is just going to provision an ESB volume, mount it on your machine, and mount uh, that um, uh, and mount the, the, the volume into into that. So here I, I've been. Uh, so I, I use the volume driver Rexray, and uh, my volume is called Mongo Data. I, I'm I'm mapping that to the data slash DB directory, uh, and that's the only difference. So when I tried that on uh, Swarm cluster on EC2 last night. Uh, what happened is that it was scheduled, it worked, my volume was created, the app was working wonderfully, but then I couldn't kill it. So I could stop it, and, but I, I just couldn't kill the container, I had to reboot the machine. So there, there, there are still some issues in there. The paint is not completely fresh there. Uh, the last thing I wanted to show you uh, before I launch a demo, and I have three more minutes, is um, how to provision a, a swarm cluster. Um, so you can provision a swarm cluster with networking setup with something like that. Uh, so that, that one is on EC2. Uh, so there are some EC2 parameters here. I say I want uh, this guy is going to be the swarm master. Uh, and there I can, I can specify a swarm discovery. So I'm, I'm going to specify a console instance where it's going to store all the data about the machines in the cluster. Uh, in terms of engine options, I can specify uh, the cluster store, which is also that console uh, uh, instance. Uh, and then with engine up with the cluster advertise, uh, I can say advertise yourself to the cluster uh, with the IP address that you have on uh, uh, Ethernet zero uh, network card. And so one, once you do that, basically you have a cluster uh, with one master and two machines. You can see here that I added an engine label with storage SSD. Uh, and this guy, I added a label of a storage drive. So that's a very easy way with a simple script to create a cluster with different labels and then started uh, scheduling some uh, containers on that. So when I do, um, actually I'm going to show you maybe the, um, 
Docker info. So, I'm so here, this cluster is just provisioned on my local machine. I have just uh, two machines in there, the master and uh, storage equals SSD, the, the second machine. And here, I'm just going to do a Docker compose up. But I pass uh, dash dash x networking and dash dash x uh, network driver equal overlay. Uh, and I pass the compose file that I just showed you, and this guy should start my Spring application. It's starting the database, it's starting the Spring, the Spring application, and then it's showing me all the logs. And I need to go to uh, another... Oh, no. Uh... Okay. Uh, so this guy is on that host. Uh, so let's try that in the browser. Okay. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's see if it came up. Yeah, it came up. Uh, so there the application is working, which means uh, I can, uh, whoops. Uh, yeah, which means I can take an image there, drop it in there, and it's going to uh, uh, store it in MongoFS and show me the result. So I'm just going to make that a little bit bigger. And if I go over there, it's serving it from MongoFS and it adds a bunch of uh, gobbledygook. Uh, that's uh, Josh, uh, Josh humor. Uh, but basically, it works. Uh, and if I go there in my window, I can see, uh, I should be able to see the logs uh, of the application. And uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah, the application and the database. OK, time's up. Uh, I hope that gave you a desire to go uh, deeper with um, the new networking stuff in Docker. Uh, I'll publish my slide uh, after this talk. I have a bunch of other examples in there that you can explore. And all the code that I showed you is on my GitHub repository. And, and these are mentioned in the, in the slides. Have fun. Thanks. <laughs>